Hello and welcome to DesignCast, a podcast where I interview a wide range of excellent guests in design and STEAM education to get their unique perspectives. My name is Jason Regan and I use my 20 plus years of experience as a design educator to dig deep into complex issues. This podcast has one simple mission, to create a community of people around the world that are interested in design and STEAM education. Each episode, I chat with guests from all corners of the design world, from classroom teachers to authors and even to educational consultants. We discuss a wide range of topics that we feel are relevant today. I do want to ask you that if you're enjoying this podcast, please leave a review, rate, subscribe, share, or download from your favorite podcasting app. This helps the podcast get discovered by listeners that might not find it otherwise. Also, it helps me to continually define the direction of future guests and episodes. Feel free to drop by my website, www.jasonreagan.ga, to leave me a comment or to sign up to be considered as a future guest on future episodes. Also, don't forget to stop by Anchor and leave me a voice clip that could even end up in an upcoming show. Thanks for listening. So let's get to it. Hello, I'm Alex Braden, and I listen to DesignCast from Shanghai, China. Hello, I'm JD, and I listen to DesignCast from Qingdao, China. Hi, I'm Chris Willauer, and I listen to DesignCast from Shanghai, China. Welcome back to another episode of Design Cast. And on this episode, I had the opportunity to speak to Liz Gallo. Liz is the CEO of WhyMaker. WhyMaker is a STEM professional development company that focuses on cultivating technology based project plans with teachers to improve students' overall success. We had a great time talking all about STEM and the maker movement. Liz has a book called Surfing on Rocks and recommends that everyone reads The Coaching Habit, both of which I have linked in the show notes. You can check out WhyMaker at whymaker.co. All of the social media channels are right there on the website. I highly recommend going and having a look. On a different note, please subscribe, rate, and share this podcast with people in your network who you feel would benefit from hearing it. Additionally, if you have any ideas for future episodes, I'd love to hear about them. Or if you would even like to be a guest, please reach out through my website, which is www.jasonreagan.ga, and there's a link for that in the show notes. In the back of the website, the last page of the website anyway, there's a contact form for me. So just fill that out and I will get back to you as quickly as I possibly can. Also, if you go over to the Anchor website where this podcast is housed, you can leave me a voicemail. I'd love to hear from you and it may, hey, you might even show up on a future episode. Now sit back, relax and enjoy this chat that I have with Liz Gallo. Welcome back to another edition of Design Cast, and I am so excited to have Liz Gallo here with me today. Hey, Liz, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Liz, I would really like for you to introduce yourself and kind of tell how you, your journey to get where you are now. I think a lot of listeners will really enjoy hearing about that. Yeah, so I'm Liz Gallo. I am currently the CEO and founder of WhyMaker, which is a professional development organization for STEM and Maker Ed. I was was a technology and engineering teacher for over 10 years. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York, and have worked all over New York State 
teaching. And I also just told Jason that I worked abroad. I taught abroad in Croatia for a little bit many years ago. So I love teaching. I love technology ed. I love STEM. And I started Winemaker to really bring that love and passion to more teachers and more students. When you were a teacher, what age group did you teach? I taught everybody from kindergarten through 12th grade. Oh, you're kidding me. So what kind of school was that in? So I taught in four different schools. I taught in a charter school. I taught kindergarten through eighth grade there, technology education. Then I taught in a typical large district public school where I taught sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And I taught, did some work with teachers there too. Then I worked in a a special ed school. So a kid uh, for students with special needs taught kindergarten through 12th grade there. And then in my last job, I taught sixth graders technology ed. And you were using what the technology ed standards and benchmarks were using Project Lead the Way. What were you using? What program? Yeah, they were all my own programs, everything I created (laughs) um, (laughs) based on like ITEA standards. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, Yeah. I was just curious. So so we use a lot of ITEA stuff as well as all over the world, but that one particularly, I'm very familiar with them from my work in the States. And so, okay. And so you use like the Technology for All American standards or or whatever they call it? Yeah, the technology literacy Mm. standards. They just just released some new ones, the standards for technology and engineering literacy. And they have released them in such an interesting way because they really, in these standards, they're really focusing on showing the intersections between all the different disciplines of technology and how it's connected to math and science Mm. and engineering and like essential skills. So they're it's about really interesting. Time someone did that, right? <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. They're a beautiful document. You know, first, like a typical tech ed teacher, not everything has changed, which is nice. Mm. They've kept a lot of the really good stuff, just have shown it in a different light, which I really like. Yeah, that's great. I find that probably the, the biggest struggle of STEM or STEAM teachers is those intersections. So that's great mm-hmm. to hear that that has been, in a sense, rectified <laughs> and mm-hmm. started to, you know, kind of come, come together and, and create those bonds, which is fantastic. And so tell me about your business. So it's called Why Maker? Yep. Why Maker? Why Maker? Why Maker Education? <laughs> Started three years ago when I was teaching in my last job. It's actually an interesting story. Someone reached out to me and said, check out what this guy Lewis is doing down in Astoria, Queens. And I was like, mm, what's Lewis doing? I don't know Lewis. Who's Lewis? So I read my email finally. And Lewis is helping a school design and build a makerspace. And I realized that uh, if one school needs help designing and building a makerspace, Mm. many schools need help designing and building a makerspace. So I left the classroom to start helping schools design and build makerspaces. And what I quickly realized is that schools and teachers value me more for my ability to teach than my ability to design Mm. a space. Mm. So I quickly pivoted to doing professional development for teachers. And I absolutely love this professional development where I can help others. I can help so many more children than I could in my classroom. And I love that feeling of being able to do that. That's amazing. Yeah. I think that that is what's missing in makers education is, is that link between, oh, we have all this really cool, shiny stuff. And now how do we train people to use it and to use it appropriately? And so do you have a space that you do that? Or do you go out to the schools and work directly in their spaces? What's the best method for you? So I go to schools typically, and I work in their spaces. I work with their teachers in their schools. Not everybody has a maker space, and that's Mm -hmm. totally fine. The goal is just to build STEM and maker ed skills in teachers so that they can do STEM and maker ed projects with their kids in their classes. And this is with all sorts of teachers. So like elementary school teachers who are teaching every subject to high school teachers who are teaching really specific subjects. We've even worked with like college professors and how they can integrate more hands-on STEM and make red into what they're teaching. So we've worked with a wide range of people over the past couple of years mm-hmm. to really boost STEM and maker education across the country and the world. That's awesome. I've had a look at your website. It's incredibly robust. I'm really impressed with the amount of stuff that you have up there. Can you tell me a little bit more about the business itself? We're a small business. We a woman-owned business, so I own it. Oh, which fantastic. Is, yeah, which is... <laughs> 
<laughs> it's silly to say, but it's actually really beneficial because lots mm-hmm. of federal grants and local state grants here mm-hmm. in America mm-hmm. require percentages of grant money to go to minority and women-owned businesses. So I'm so grateful that we were able to get that. Typical non-COVID model is that we go to schools and train teachers. We have a small but mighty team of professional development providers that mm-hmm. you know we send out based on the needs of the school. So some people who are really experienced with using high-end tools, laser engravers, 3D printers, CNC mm-hmm. machines, mm-hmm. as school has those things, we send you know our expert trainer in that. Pre-K, if a school has a pre-K and they really want to boost up their pre-K program, we have a special trainer we send out for pre-K. My sweet spot is that middle school, upper elementary age. So that's where I focus a lot of my efforts. We also do a lot of stuff with computer science and coding, computational thinking. So we work with schools in that too. The overall business model is the professional development is our main business and what I really want to do. That's how I love helping teachers. But we also sell STEM products. So we sell Edison robots and Sam Labs and 3Docs Design you know, provide content on all these things and all these products to teachers. We sell them because I, as a teacher, I would use them in my classroom because they're Mm -hmm. that great. Mm -hmm. We also have an online course that teachers can take to get up to speed on how to teach STEM, how to teach Maker Ed right now. And it's really great for anyone who needs like an introduction of how do I plan a STEM or Maker Ed project, really building those skills and those processes. And then we've been offering uh, weekly workshops for teachers. So building this community of teachers to join our weekly workshops and have great conversations with their peers across the country. People have been joining from everywhere. So really trying to bring that to life. So the actual physical going into schools um, Mm -hmm. and working with schools, is most of that going to be based around sort of the New York area for you guys? Or do you go all over the country or sort of what is it at the moment? I know you said you're three years old. So what's sort of like logistical bandwidth at the moment? We will travel anywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm... I can, I can travel anywhere at any time and I love it. So we do work, we're doing work with a school in Texas, uh, Maryland. We do work all over New York state doing work in Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island. So a lot of the Northeast here, but willing to travel anywhere. Currently we're doing a lot of stuff virtually. We're sending maker kits to teachers and doing professional development with them virtually, which is exciting. And then that actually increases our bandwidth and increases you know, the amount of workshops that we can do when we're not traveling. So yeah, we're trying to grow. We're trying to bring in new trainers and bring on new business. It's all growing pains. It sounds like you guys have made the best out of a not so great situation with our current global Mm -hmm. situation. But I've found in doing this podcast, a lot of people have found some really bright spots and being able to adjust and change their mode of delivery. And so hopefully that'll be part of your toolbox moving forward. It sounds like that's a, I like that idea of getting something in the mail and then getting on Zoom and finding out how to use it and stuff. That's super cool that you guys were able to to continue to do that because I'm sure, you know, any support teachers get, they're very appreciative of that. I know that that's one industry that people really appreciate any professional development that they can get. Yes, teachers love getting the box and then coming on and like, oh, what do we get? What can we make? Um, <laughs> and that, I mean, of course they love it. It's so great. We're also trying to do that for kids too, like send kit, work with schools to send kids, oh, wow. kids to kids. There's so much potential there. There's so much mm-hmm. potential. Uh, some schools are doing it, but I think we yeah. could be doing more of that now. And the support for teachers, that's what I'm here. I just mm-hmm. want to help. I just want to support teachers. I just mm-hmm. want to make everyone feel good about what they're doing and help keep them excited and engaged and reinvigorated to keep teaching. Yeah, I think we need that more now than we ever have needed it. Some highlights in what we're doing. And so that's unbelievable. That's so cool that you guys have been able to pivot like that and be really nimble with your business. And so what is your vision? What do you want to see happen 5, 10, 20 years from now? So the vision for Ymaker is to Mm -hmm. be the largest STEM provider. STEM professional (laughs) development provider in the U.S. I love providing professional development and I want to do an excellent job of it and continue to do it for as many teachers as possible. Every year we set a goal to train a certain number of teachers. Last school year we trained 2,000 teachers. 
just wow. over 2,000 teachers. This year, we're on track to train <laughs> well over 4,000, well over 4,000. Yeah. So every year, just trying to increase the number of teachers that we're training, that we're, that are accessing us, that are connecting with us to build a force of STEM and maker ed mm-hmm. teachers mm-hmm. Or, or just, just STEM minded teachers and try to revolutionize education. Why stop at the U.S.? <laughs> I am not stopped at the U.S. That is at all. I actually was yeah. just speaking with someone in Germany last week okay. about doing some work out there, you know, at an international school in mm-hmm. Germany mm-hmm. and talking about coaching and helping train coaches in their school to coach for STEM and maker ed, which I love that model. We do that a lot. So yeah, we're ready to expand. We did work some work in Mexico um, with an international school in Mexico City. I love traveling, so I'll go anywhere. (laughs) Yeah, I do too. And uh, it's been tough. I've been able to do it. Absolutely. I will say that the STEM movement is only growing. I don't ever see it, at at least in my lifetime, changing. I only see it growing and, and maybe evolving, but I know that where those crossroads between those different subjects meet is incredibly important. And I think that as industries need more people who can do that, it's only going to continue to increase in demand. And so that's a great model that you guys have got. That's really, really exciting. You got me excited and and (laughs) I get excited a lot, but you got me really excited because you're talking about the things I really enjoy. And so if a school doesn't have a, a, like a maker space, what's sort of the approach to getting them into the maker mindset? Great question. It's challenging whether you do have a makerspace or you don't have a makerspace. There's challenges both ways. The typical kind of challenges to overcome are like, personally, I feel logistics. How do I bring my students to the makerspace? I don't know what those tools do. I don't know how to use them. I don't want to. I don't want to change my curriculum. I don't have time, but the tests, but the exam, right? (laughs) So those typical things are what I hear a lot from teachers and from school leaders. The honestly, the best thing that a school can do is have the administration be incredibly supportive and say things to teachers like, just try it. Um, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We'll try it again. Just try it. I want you to experience what it's like. We're here to support you. I'm here to help you. I'm not going to evaluate you on this experience that you're giving your students. So having administrative support and and saying those words to their staff Mm -hmm. is so important. Also, what we focus on at Ymaker is how to build a STEM project and how do you go through the process of getting this like hands-on kind of experience for kids. You know, as tech teachers, a lot of it comes natural to us because of the way we were taught mm-hmm. and we've been doing it for years, but it doesn't come natural to, to other typical classroom teachers. But they do know how to do hands-on projects with students. They just need to understand what are all the little pieces they need to figure out in order to be successful. So we walk with teachers through project plans and thinking about you know what's all the little details that we need to include in our projects to make sure that everyone has success. And then the third thing or the fourth thing, I don't know how many were on, is assessment. (laughs) Teachers get very scared about assessment. How am I going to assess my students? And what we focus on is assessing for essential skills or life skills. So Mm -hmm. how collaborative were you? How creative Mm -hmm. were you? You know, how well did you work in a team? How prompt were you? And assessing those skills, you can assess for them. There are some great tools out there to do that. So we help teachers understand how to do that too. And you mentioned about the administrative support. Do you also have training for administrators? Is that something people ask for? No, they don't ask for that. (laughs) I'm starting to recognize the importance of Mm -hmm. an honest and open conversation with the administration Mm -hmm. about what I need, what I need from them, what they can tell me about their school, because it's their school. They know everything that's going on. So it's super helpful that they share a ton of information with me and then uh, of what to expect and how I can use your support. This open, honest conversation before we engage is really important to build a great STEM culture and community Mm -hmm. in your school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we work on building leaders within the school. So lead coaches, you know, someone is always super into it and we'll jump right into it. So we like kind of help them develop some leadership skills around how to help others. Do you find that the science teachers or the math teachers or the the tech ed teachers are the most willing to to learn? Which which ones have you found to be the most open-minded? Uh, no one in particular. Oh, okay. Tech ed, tech, ed, <laughs> tech ed teachers will often tell you, I already do this. 
Yeah, and I say, yeah, I know, totally. I need your help yeah. to help others do this. There is a little resistance there, but it has to be a, a community here that's working together to help support our students. Agreed. I do a lot of professional development for the International Baccalaureate and mm -hmm. teaching teachers. They're the hardest group of people to teach. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we still, it's an important job, so we have to do it, but um, mm -hmm. they know everything, so that's good. That's really good. They tell you exactly what you've done wrong, which is, is yep. great. <laughs> yep. I love it. <laughs> it's great. So Liz, tell me what you're really excited about at the moment, because I know right now it's easy to focus on all the negative, but what's something you're really, really excited about looking forward? Yeah. I'm going to share with you what I'm really scared about and then what I'm really excited okay. about. Okay, so great. Currently, we're seeing in a lot of our schools that we work with, that we're trying to work with, that they're really focused on math and ELA and they are, kids are really, really bored. They are, mm -hmm. kids are disengaged. If they're remote, they're turning off their cameras. They're not doing their work. They're not showing up. There's this huge, huge disengagement with our students and it's really, really frightening. And the reason they're disengaged is because they're bored. They're literally bored. They're doing nothing in their classes, filling out a Google slide, filling out a Google form. That's not substantial creating or substantial learning. What I'm really excited about is the ability to change that slippery slope back up so that our students are completely engaged and excited about the work they're doing, whether they're six feet away from each other or miles apart. We have the potential to literally change our education system right now instead of just like hot gluing it back together. And I'm so excited about the potential to work with schools who are open-minded about that and ready to take on that that challenge. Mm. And there's so much we can do. I'm also excited about this idea of like remote, like this sounds crazy, remote learning, because <laughs> a study I read recently from Mercer said that between 35 and 40% of the workforce will never return to in-person work. They will wow. be remote forever. So what I say to teachers is there is a 40% chance or 40% of the kids in your room are going to work remotely. So we need to think about how we're going to help those kids learn how to work remotely. If the other 60% that's not working remotely will probably be working with someone who is remote. <laughs> so yeah. we need to help kids understand how to have that communication across distances. And I'm super excited for that now too. I would love to hear that, uh, to, to find out more about that study you, you read mm -hmm. from Mercer. Maybe we can, you can share that with me and I can pop it in the show notes if, if you have it on hand. Sure. I, would, I think that a lot of people in who would be listening to this podcast would, would have a very similar feeling that this is a time when things are changing. I can say that I'm sure you probably have the same sentiment that most likely you were doing flip classrooms way back when, when you were teaching and you were doing at least, you know, some asynchronous learning and, and that kind of thing, even if it was just for review or revision or whatever. And so, wow, that's really amazing. And we have to have those strategies because I don't think anyone's had strategies for Zoom fatigue. I think <laughs> we have to find a way to get around that. But you're right. I mean, I do remember taking university classes remotely. I was in a different part of the state and I went into a room at a, you know, another campus and was watching the teacher on a television. Liz, can you tell me what book you would recommend everyone read right now? On an unrelated note to teaching, I wrote a book. Oh, wow. Um, cool. Yeah, I wrote a book. It's called Surfing on Rocks. It's on Amazon. It's a memoir, a life experience I had that was traumatic and like changed my life and actually did set the groundwork to starting Why Maker. So okay. uh, it's, it's a short read, fast read. It's a great story. So that is a great book. And I love this book called The Coaching Habit by Michael Bundy Stringer, Stanger, okay. Stainer. The Coaching Habit. It's not an education book. It's a book about sure. coaching employees. He has five very targeted questions to ask people when they come to you in a panic, uh, when they oh, come okay. to you with you know, a, a problem or something's wrong yeah. or something not, is not right. It has really been like the foundation for the work that we do at Ymaker um, and helping okay. train those leaders in our school because it's not this big, complicated process. It's five questions. And I 
really like it's a, it's a quick read too. So definitely check that one out. I like it. That's great. And you know, what's funny, I interview a lot of educators or people who are involved in education for this podcast. And rarely do I get an education book <laughs> when oh. I ask that question. Most of the time, it's, it's that kind of thing where there's a book that's about something totally different that they've been able to transfer that knowledge to their experience or what they're doing. And so that's cool that you put that in there. Thank you yeah. for doing that. And so who, who should we follow on Twitter at the moment? Two of my favorite people in New York are John Redeker and Lisa Blank. So they work in typical public schools here in New York, and they are great on Twitter. They are great sharing what their schools are doing, sharing out great content that's helpful for lots and lots of people and having really thoughtful dialogue on Twitter. Okay, great. I'll make sure those are in the show notes. And sure. if Liz, if people want to get in touch with you and find out more about your work or possibly partner with you, because I have a lot of listeners from around the world who might want to really find out how they can be involved with the work you're doing. What's the best way to get in touch with you and to be involved in your work? You're welcome to send me an email, lizgallo at ymaker.co. You can check out our website at ymaker.co, dot C-O, W-H-Y-M-A-K-E-R. Um, and on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, mm. LinkedIn. LinkedIn. We have a YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> we have all those things at Winemaker. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I see too on your website that you're always looking for more trainers and 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 people to help you do things. And so are you are you open to the idea of folks from outside of the US helping you expand your business? I'm going to be honest, the stem and maker stuff has slowed down the last couple of months, starting to pick back up. So yeah, so definitely if there is work there abroad, <laughs> we are always looking for trainers sure. um, to go out and train and help and build this mm -hmm. community and build more stem and maker ed kids around the world. I will tell you that, and I don't know if these are folks listening, but there's a huge movement in Asia particularly, and I think it's across the world, but uh, for public schools to add STEM to what they're doing. And I'm finding more and more schools are opening with a STEM focus. You know, a lot of stuff is made in Asia. So that a lot of people are thinking, hey, this is what we need to do to keep our livelihood kind of thing or, or whatever it might be. So I am sure that there is just a burgeoning market that says yeah. uh, we want this kind of thing. So I think you're really in the right place at the right time and really well positioned to mm -hmm. to do this. And, and I think it's great what you guys are doing. I am really, really excited. I really like your website. I've already been through it, had a look at it, and I really appreciate it. It's very professional and you guys have some great resources there. So thank you for putting that up and making that available for teachers. And it's been such a pleasure talking to you, Liz. I really, thank really you. appreciate it. I know it's very early there <laughs> as it's getting very late where, where I'm at, but oh. I do appreciate you spending time with me and talking about your business. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm super excited to continue to stay in touch and connect with anybody <laughs> else who's interested in learning more. Thank you so much, Liz. I hope you enjoyed that episode of DesignCast. I'm Jason, your host, and I produced and created this podcast. If you have any input, I would love to hear from you. And I look forward to seeing you again really soon. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. Explore more podcasts at www.teachbetterpodcastnetwork.com. We will see you on the next episode.